and it was like a fairy tale cottage up in the woods. You know, we had spring water. We could have our chickens there, fresh eggs and all that. I went to look for my father. Knew he was in the wood on his own. He was murdered with two unlicensed shotguns. And 20 minutes later, I got shot as well. I was 14 years old. He'd threatened my dad with a shotgun before. He was in the wood one night and my dad had a click behind him and it was Terry Moore sat there with a shotgun. And then all of a sudden, it was like, bang, real deep, boom. And I remember my heart sunk. Unbeknown to me, I was actually stood in the spot where my dad had just been shot. There was no blood, bone or tissue at all on Terry Moore. Not a rip shirt. There's no fingerprints on my dad's gun. It, what's he going to do? And I remember sitting there saying, yeah, I'm 14 now, but I won't be fucking 14 forever. They could drag him in there, get him in a really naked choke. I can prop my feet against the doors, jam it shut. I thought he'd be dead by the time they get in at me. You fuckers now are going to feel my pain and your family's going to feel my pain. They conspired. They bought the shotguns the same day and they never even got to the jury. It got kicked out for insufficient evidence. And how did they justify the second shooting? Just a quick one. I want to thank our main sponsors, Bauer Security. They're a UK-based security firm that cover the entertainment, industrial, corporate, and construction industries. I'm going to leave the links to their Instagram and their website below in the description so you can contact them direct. You can also find my own social media platforms down there too. And if you've got this far and you haven't yet liked and subscribed to the channel, can I ask that you do so? It takes two seconds, costs nothing, and it helps us improve the experience for the guests and for those at home watching. Thanks again. Your support is greatly appreciated and I hope you enjoy this one. Lee, thanks for coming on to share your story with me. Liam, thank you for having me down today. This is gonna be a little bit like, I think, a bit like therapy for me, to be honest. Mm, well, it, the, the story needs to be, it needs to be told and it needs to be heard. So in, in 1990, yeah. your father was murdered on his own land? Yeah, he was, un he was murdered with two unlicensed shotguns. And 20 minutes later, I got shot as well. I was 14 years old. I went to look for my father. Knew he was in the wood on his own. And um, the perpetrators, after murdering my dad, thought I was a witness to it. This is what I believe, thought I was a witness to the shooting, trying to, to, try to murder me as well. What we're going to do is, to give people that are watching and listening a better perspective of you, the circumstance, your life, your relationship with your dad, the impact yeah. it's had, the miscarriage of justice and the ongoing box that keeps reopening. Mm. Let's go back and just tell me about where you're from, your childhood and the relationship you had with your dad. Um, I'm from Stroud, uh, Gloucestershire, England. Um, born, in, born in Stroud, so Stroud through and through. Um, I don't, I don't, very lucky because as you get older, you realise that, um, especially this day and age, the kids haven't got a real proper father figure, you know? And I was very lucky to have a dad, an idol. That I think every young boy needs a dad and girl who, who's there like their Superman, you know? And he was to me. Great, great childhood. We lived in, uh, in the countryside. We had a dad run a small holding. And he was a very hardworking bloke, proper old school, you know? I've never known a bloke to work so hard as him. It was ridiculous hours he was doing just to keep a roof over our head. But growing up, fantastic childhood. We'd go to, on holidays once a year. Um, I'd spend a lot of time with him down the farm with the cat, with the sheep and all that stuff, you know, all the hillbilly stuff, I say. But yeah, so, so growing up, I had, I had a fantastic, fantastic childhood in a rural area. And it, was, it was brilliant, mate. Really and your mum and dad were solid? They were solid, mate. They had their ups and downs, like every relationship. And I put a lot of that down to the pressure where he ended up moving to. And my mum does still feel a little bit guilty to this day because she said, if I hadn't wanted, if I didn't want that cottage, she found this cottage was, was, was not far from where my dad grew up in King Stanley. And it was like a fairy tale cottage up in the woods. You know, we had spring water. We could have our chickens there, fresh eggs and all that. And he didn't really want it at first because of the access situation, there was no access. Now, the estate agent at the time said, I'm sure you could do a deal with the next door neighbours. I'm sure they would. And you'd think that they'd let you use their driveway or you come up with some sort of deal, but they never did. And this is where this story uh, takes a sinister turn. So in what year did you move to the new property where there was a problem with the access? It was around 1979, I was around four or five years old. And I could always remember walking up the, the field to, to the house. Now I could see the neighbor's house in front of us. There was a long, steep path. And then our house, the cottage to the left. And I always remember there's a guy, his name's Peter Corner, really nice guy. He still lives there now, he's in his eighties. And he had a little sausage dog. I remember stroking it and I was about, yeah, five years old. But again, like I say, as a kid, that is a, seems like a hell of a walk. It's like walking up Mount Everest at that, mm. at that, that age. 
And I remember getting up there, and I remember just running from one end of the garden to the other. And I remember we had this, we had this well, and it was a pump, hand pump, uh, you know, because it, it's, it's like even then that was still sort of primitive, you know, because everybody had running water, but we had a, we had a hand pump in the garden to get the water out, and then we had a, also uh, we had there was a tank, and so water was gravity fed into the cottage. But it, it was for, as a, for a kid, it's great, you know, you got all this, you got all this land. And that to, to, to play on, it was, it was a fantastic time. Sounds glorious. It was, it's, it's fantastic. It mate. sounds like the ideal family setting yeah. and a lovely, lovely life compared to, a, compared to a lot of people that I speak to, their childhoods have normally been pretty groggy. Pretty groggy. So yeah. you, you've, yours was ideal. It was a perfect childhood. When, when you look back now, it's like I still grew up in those woods now because we ended up purchasing the woods and that's what unfortunately my dad got murdered over. But I still go there now and be oh, what you, you did it, bad man? Yeah, it's bad man, but there's some great memories there. And I feel that my dad was, they wanted him out of that place. And by me going there, it's like he's still there. And it's like a fucking flag when in the you, ground. When you say they wanted him out of the place, who's they? That village of Kingston is a corrupt little clicky place. Let's be honest about it. It, it is, it's a click. Now they always saw my dad as an outsider, because even though he moved there when he's eight months old, they saw him as an outsider. Now my uncle told me this, and other people have told me this. Like the little farming community, they saw him as an outsider and they get all clicky. And when my dad was about 15 years old, he went with his father and my uncle up onto Salsey Common to unload some cattle because where they had a little small hold in, in, in King Stanley, they were allowed to have what they call commoners rights when you put these cows up on the, on the common and they grazed for free. They were told, you can't put these up here, you know, you haven't got commoners rights. And my dad said, well, he's only 15, well, we're up here now, it's too late. Drop the tailgate down and the cattle run out, and that was it, they were on the common. My grandfather, who'd, who'd served as a chindit in the Second World War, very laid back at that time, didn't want the hassle, but it was like I said, it was too late, my dad had, had let the cattle out, and that was like his first stand. So you, your dad had fighting spirit? 100%, mate, yeah, fighting spirit, you know. Describe him as a as a, as a man, how, how the majority of people that knew him would describe him. A man's man, a, a man's man, a, a, a fucking loyal friend, do anything for anybody, what I struggle with at times is, is the shit, that, 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 especially in the court, that they made up about him. He, he was a t he was a, t he, a bloke said to me, he's like Rocky Marciano, you know, they, they try to make out he was a lot bigger than what he was. I'm actually physically bigger than my dad. I struggle to believe that because as a skinny 14 year old kid, he, t him, he had this great big wide back and that, he looked massive to me. But I've got his suit at home that he wore two months before he was murdered and it's tight on me. And it is, it's tight on me. It's been like that since I was 18. But, he had a massive, massive heart, you know. I remember my girlfriend at the time, I was 13 years old, her dad passed away. My dad never met him. And he, I remember, I remember seeing, he cried his eyes out because it upset him that they were left fatherless. I remember him cry, crying his eyes out. I'd, you know, and he had a massive heart. But what I can say is people would say he was, a, he was an honest bloke, he was a hard man, he was a, he was a natural fighting man. But when you find that with people like that, but they're straight and honest, they're, they're decent people. But yeah, uh, yeah, like I said, a loyal friend, a fantastic sense of humour, fantastic with animals. I remember this lady saying to me once, she said, they, they said all this stuff about your dad, but I saw him like, he saved my lamb, my lambs were dying. And he was there, sat with him for hours and hours on end and brought them all back. They were freezing to death and they were starving. He brought them all back and spent time with them, you know, and that, that, was, a, that was the sort of guy he was, you know, and a fantastic father, do you know what I mean? You know? Was he popular? You know, he was popular, you know, he was popular. We'd go down the road in the Land Rover and, and people would put his hands up to him and I liked him and yeah, he really was, mate, you know, yeah. Terry Moore's the neighbour that yes. had a serious conflict with your dad. Yeah, yeah. How did that conflict begin? It all began because we, when we when we moved in the cottage, right, that we'd never had any access, so we had to walk up this field. Now, my father approached them with my mum back in around about 1980. I might have these facts, I know it's near that time, and offered him money for access. He said, look, I'll reinstate, reinstate the drive. Can we have shared access? You want, I'll do all that. Let me think about it, he said. And my dad went up, back along there. He said, come along, come, come back along tomorrow night. So dad went along there and he wanted a ridiculous amount of money. It really taking the piss back then. You know, just, it's just greed. So the, the, the relationship started going down a little bit from there, you know. So what made it worse is that we had to struggle with shopping. This, this, this Terry Moore used to watch us struggle at the, my mum struggle up with shopping at this long driveway. My dad used to carry bags of dog food up on his, shot, on his shoulder. When we eventually had an extension done, my dad had to get the materials down through the woodland. There's a woodland to the back of our house. And he got he got to know um, the cooks who were in the wood at the time and he had a good relationship with them. And they said, listen, if you keep an eye on the boundary fences, 
keep it on the woodland, you know. You can use the, the, the wood as a track. It wasn't ideal, but my dad had a four-wheel drive Land Rover and they could, he'd use the track to get down through the wood. So he was able to get, like, some goods and stuff like that. It was a long way round to get there, hmm. but at least we could still get some stuff to the house. As a kid, I wasn't even allowed to ride my bike down their driveway. I remember riding my bike down as a, like a six-year-old kid, and it was like the, the wife, Molly Moore, she's, get off, shout them, get off that bike and push it down. I was like, well, you know, you're a kid, you thought, well, you, you respect your elders. I've always been brought up with my mum and dad, you've got to respect your elders. So I got off my bike and started pushing it down. And then sometimes you get a bit of devilment in you as a kid, and I haven't listened down, just off I go, race down as quick as I could, and, and off I go. But looking back on that, I was just a kid. Why? Why be like that? Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a driveway. It's a concrete drive. What you go? What's a kid gonna do to it? Do you know what I mean? But this went on for ages. This went on for many years, and it just the, the, the just it was just more and more tension, more and more tension. We come back and the dogs would be let out, power lines cut and stuff. Never could never prove who it was. It was reported to the police. Nothing really done about it. And if I go forward a few years, this woodland behind our house came up for sale. Now, my dad couldn't afford to buy it on his own, nor my mum with what they were earning, but my dad's boss at the time, he said, listen, I understand you're in a bit of a predicament. If I can come up with half the money, could you come up with the other half the money and we'll buy this woodland? At least you've got your access. Because at the time, there was no access. And that house, you wouldn't have to sell it on. Mm. With, it, it, to the right person, maybe, but with the access, it had been a lot easier for us than we could have possibly uh, sold it on. Because my dad's ultimate goal was to retire in his mid-40s and get a farm somewhere, maybe France and Wales, and just go away peacefully off into the sunset, basically, you know. This woodland came up for sale. Then Terry Moore, what he did, he had a field next to his house and a, with, a, with a boundary fence, a long boundary fence. And what he did, he started encroaching onto our land, stealing the fence, stealing the woodland. Now, back at that time in 1990, they were, they were called grade A beech trees, dead straight trees. They were worth a lot of money uh, in, 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 for timber. So he started stealing these trees. And my dad was thinking, I can remember, I, I, heard, his con I heard the conversation with Mum. He said, you know what, we've had all this hassle off him on the, over the years, not let us use his driver. People couldn't even visit us. They'd have to, we'd have to say, look, park at the bottom because it just causes friction. And how long would that walk be? If someone parks um, at the bottom, how long would it take them? It'd take them probably about 15, 20 minutes. And it's a steep, it's steep, it's a steep, and it's, if you're an older person, it's hell of a, hell of a you know, jaunt. Yeah, that's ridiculous. It's, it's, no, it's ridiculous, it's ridiculous. But that's what we were up against. Now, after he bought this woodland, and I can understand, when I think about it now, I think he had the patience of Job with this, this mall, because, you know, he's not only wouldn't let us have the, the access, We've had shit off them over the years, stuff going missing. And I, as, as a kid, you don't really know what's going on. You can, you can sense the detention there. And like I say, with the not allowed to ride bikes down the driveway and that, and there was a bit of tension there, and my friends couldn't drive at the driveway to see us. Did Terry Moore have a reputation in the village? I remember talking to some guy uh, year, years later, because as a kid, like, you see, don't really, it's adult stuff, you don't really get to hear about it. Barry used to bully people down where he come from, you know? And, but the locals, I say, he used to steal people's land and he was known for it. You know, he, he, it's, it's in the court trial papers that he fired his gun off over some walkers walking through the field, just shot the gun off, you know, to, to intimidate them. And, and, did he, sort of, and did Terry have any kids? Yeah, yeah, two kids, yeah. Similar age yeah. to you? Uh, no, a bit older than me. And did you ever mingle with them? No, I didn't. I, we, we, as a kid, we used to walk, walk to school together at one time, go to school together, but then they were stopped to do, stop doing that. And then the tension started, there's all this stuff going on with, with the adults and that, you know, with, and over the boundary and everything else and, and, the, and the driveway. And that, that, that sort of diminished. So did that tension spill down to you and Terry's kids? Not really. I just didn't really see them. Obviously, different age groups. And we're at schools at different times. It, it didn't, didn't see them, you know. Okay, so Terry, a feared man. Yeah, he was. He was locally. Those people were scared of him. And they, 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 this is the thing about this, this that little village, King Stanley, right? There's some decent people there. There's also some shit houses there who are two faced, and they probably said, "Oh yeah, Tony's a big bully. This that and he was, you know, because he could have a row." But he'd be the first person they go knocking on the door. Oh, Tony, come out, us. This bloke's doing this to us. This bloke's doing that to us. But when the tires are turned, stab you in the back. And that's what they're like. And I'm convinced to this day, there's people in that little village who know stuff and they're just keeping their mouths shut. Yeah, because they're frightened, gutless. Well, someone 
normally knows something. Yeah, they do, 100%. And this is the thing over the years, you get people whispering, look, there's hearsay, don't get me wrong. We, you, people like to say stuff because some people are a bit twisted you know, we get a kick out of it. I'd imagine that's been big news for as many years as it's, it's been going on for. Yeah, it is. But again, it's like, like I said, this year, it's like 34 years ago. And like I was, I was um, up in the wood not so long ago, and it's like, like 17, and he said, oh, yeah, no, we heard about all this. It's like folklore now. We don't know what's true and what's not true. And it's like somebody said to me a couple of years, yeah, but we don't really know what went on at that night. Yeah, we fucking do. I can tell you the fucking truth. I said, you know, you've heard their side of the story. Nobody's heard of dad's side of the story, you know? It was fucking murdered. It's corrupt. It's bent. Mm. So the build-up to the murder. Yeah. Do you remember tensions increasing i mean say say six months before yeah it was see terry moore he'd threatened my dad with a shotgun before he was in the wood one night and my dad had a click behind him and it was terry moore sat there with a shotgun right and my dad said oh, for me terry now my dad wasn't easily scared he wasn't he, he very stoic he wasn't easily scared and he just he just laughed at him just just a grinned and then i think he fired the shot it was, an, it was another incident when my dad's two dogs was, was having a bit of a scrap and then uh he fired a gun off and he looked around and it was tearing all the gun again. It's like sly intimidation tactics. But they reported to the old Bill. So uh, let's, get it, let's get it on record because he knew how sly and devious he was. Because like I say, we'd come back and find cats, one of our cats, in a trap. And my brother went around there. You mentioned this the other day. He said, oh, have you seen my cat, Terry? No, I haven't seen him. And he was in a, in a cat trap around the side of his house. What's that all about? Hmm. We had dogs poisoned. We couldn't prove it. You know, but yes, going back to that. There was tensions building up. I mean, did your did your dad and Terry ever have a fisty? No, they didn't. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. There's a there's a rumor, right? There's a rumor, and this did happen, where my dad at Penn Lane, he goes, oh yeah, he beat Terry Moore up at Ten Lane. If, uh, Pe uh, sorry, up Coombe Lane. Oh, t you know, Terry jumped out on him. No, he tried to run my dad over. He come back drink driving, tried to run him over. He got out of the car. My dad had, had him on the ground. He sort of scratched my dad's face out, and he gave him a couple of little slaps. Now, now, if he wanted to give him a good idea, he mm. could have done, you know. I'm surprised he didn't, to be honest, mm. with all the shit we had off of him. And my, my dad said to him, like, I, said, I don't know more hassle from you. Don't you give me your kids any more hassle, my, my, my family anymore. I said, don't want to know, but let's put a stop to it now, you know. My dad would have been like 39, 40, and Terry Moore was 59. My dad wasn't a bully, you know. If he wanted to, he, he could have he could knocked his head off. Mm. Do you know what I mean? He didn't, you know. I wish he had, to be honest, now looking back at it. Yeah, so no other than that, moment there there was no other physical altercation no none at all nothing okay so the the, yeah. the build up to that day yeah i can remember my mum was away in france on holiday my youngest brother pete my other brother james was um with my grandmother's and uh, my grandmother's and grandfather's and nails at the time and i would spend a lot of time with dad i was the eldest and i just loved spending time with him i remember walking down the next door neighbor's driveway onto our on the way down to our little small holding we had to feed the cattle because when I had it was like six week school holidays I used to help him out by feeding all the cows and stuff and now whilst he's at work so it took a bit of pressure off him and I enjoyed doing it my mate Martin used to meet me down there and we used to get on the tractors and stuff it was great you know as a kid but I remember that morning when this was all going on with this boundary dispute because they'd take the fence down put it further Dad would take it down put it back where it's supposed to be they just went backwards and forwards over a what, so time Terry kept erecting a fence Re yeah, on, further, yeah, on your land further, Dad took it down put it back where it's supposed to be just chucked it back where this is where it's supposed to be and this was going backwards and forwards that morning I remember walking down their field I looked up and I could see about half a dozen people up in the wood blokes putting this fence up so went down the farm, did my chores today and all that, met my mate Martin. Then I'd meet my dad back at his mum's house, my grandmother's in Understanley. And I remember he came back and I said, hey, dad, I said that they'd been putting that fence up again. He's like, oh, fuck, it won't play, yeah, fucking hell. It was really getting to him, the stress of it all, do you know what I mean? And they're doing it again. How many times did Terry put that fence up? I can't remember. It was quite a few times. It was quite a few times. Yeah, it was, it was more than, definitely more than once or twice. It was a few times. And I imagine that would cost your dad a few quid Absolutely, to repair. Absolutely, yeah, you, to repair. And he knew that at Moore knew it all along. Well, we proved it in court it wasn't his land anyway. He knew it wasn't. So anyway, Dad and I we went up there. And how many there. of them were there? There was at least, at least three people there that night. So first we went straight from my grandmother's house straight up to straight up to the woodland to see if they'd uh, put this fence out and they had, um, and it even further. And I'm just, you know I remember I looked at, looked up at dad and um, and this is the thing is they try to make it who's seven foot tall. He wasn't much taller than me then when I was fourteen, and it was you could see he was like stressed with it, you know. So went from there back down to the small hole and to feed the animals, and we had a good crack that night. The last night I spent with him. 
I just I still see his face now. It's big smile on his face and big handsome man. Um, I I, I had these um these pigs, these young pigs that he, he got for me to to rear up, and I said to him, um, we used to feed him feed him barley meal and skim milk. And you mix the skim milk up with a bit of water and chuck it on it, and they used to love it. But the skim milk was quite sweet, and I said, if you try, have you tried any of that? He said, you haven't been eating it, have you? I said, yeah, it tastes all right. <laughs> so I remember he's in front of me with this, you know, like, it was in a big, it was in a big like um, bowl. A feeder, and, he, and he's like, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. And it's one of his being. I was laughing, he's laughing at me, and I always, always, always sticks to it in my mind. So, the last moments we had was, was lovely, do you know what I mean? It's nice. a good father and son type thing. Then we left there, and he got some of his fencing tools to head back up the wood. And we got back to the, the bottom of Penn Lane, and this is a massive turning point, really. And I probably wouldn't be here today if I'd have gone with him because he stopped and he said, What do you want to do? He said, Do you want to? Come up with me and now we take the fence down. I'll go along back home and feed the animals and feed your kestrel because at the time I was into folk music and I had a little kestrel and I loved it, it was brilliant. And I straight away, being a, oh no, I'll come up with you, Dad, you know. He went to put it in first again, then he stopped. He said to me, no, he said, you better not. He said, do you reckon I, he had a mate at the time called Simon and he, and, and he said, to, you know, if you ever need a hand, I'll, yeah, I'll come up and give you a hand. And I said, he said, no, go and feed the animals. He said, do you reckon I should wait for Simon? I said, yeah, I reckon you should. But being the way he was, he would never really want to drag somebody else into his problems, really. That's what he'd do it himself. This is my ass, I'll sort this out. His last words to me, well, I'll see you later. And that was the last I saw him alive. And then he went up in the wood and then the rest, the rest happened. And he was up there. I can remember I was feeding my kestrel, sat on the steps, the entrance to our house, feeding my little kestrel on my fist. I remember now looking at him, I'm thinking, He's at the one of his own in, in the wood, taking that fence down. They wouldn't do that. That sort of thing happens in the movies. Maybe in London or somewhere, or the big cities. Not here. So you had a bad feeling? I did, yeah. Anyway, I got the dogs with me, took them out across, down across the field, and I always remember seeing a guy walk across the field, and it turned out his name was Stephen Wheatley, and he was a witness at a later court date. And then all of a sudden, a loud bang, real deep boom. And I remember my heart sunk. And, I, and what he did say to me, and I've missed this bit out, he did say to me, he said, if you're any gunshots, ring the police up straight away and say your next door neighbour's fighting your dad. He said that to me, you know. And at times now I'm thinking, I can't believe you went up there. Do you know what I mean? And, but do you know what? I think deep down, he really didn't think they would have done that. Because looking back at the evidence now, he actually said to him, they made an mistake, he said, you're, you're my lad with guns, I'm going to get the police. He went stupid, do you know what I mean? He knew, you got, you got at least three men there, even one man with a dull barrel shotgun. Then one, two, three surrounding you. Do you know what I mean? It ain't worth it. And did your dad take his gun with him? No, he didn't. No, so he, he was, was un he... Completely, completely unarmed. He completely, just unarmed. had his fence and all, that's all he had with him. Completely unarmed. This was all proven in court anyway. And he just, would just win his way anyway. You know, and then I remember sort of running back and I got behind the next door neighbour's house. I remember what he said to me, should I go back and like, about for phoning the police? And I thought, do I or don't I? Then, and then I was sort of hesitating, what do I do, what do I do? Adrenaline's running through, yeah? I thought, I want to get to my dad, I want to get to my dad. And, and Summit told me, just, just keep moving forward. I was scared, petrified. <laughs> because I knew my dad was there, there's that part you think, yeah, you're still being safe. So I carried on pushing forward and I got to a spot where I believe I saw somebody crouch down with a rifle or a gun or something facing up this track. And they was, like, they was crouched down. I, I showed the police this at a later stage. And I had the two Rottweiler dogs with me and then I, I got them to go on ahead. And they went on ahead and this person seemed to disappear. There was all, it, was, it, was, it was July time, so there, was, there were leaves on the trees, so you couldn't really see. It was all moving. I thought, it looks like they've gone. And I just carried on with real great trepidation, really quietly moving step by step by step. It was starting to get a little bit darker because of the time of year it was. It was still daylight outside, but because you've got the canopy of the trees, it makes it darker. I carried on going further and further. I kept walking, listening. It was just silence, just dead quiet. Carried on going and going and going. And I eventually got to a spot where there was this metal gate. But it's the, this, this metal gate is still there now to this day. Unbeknown to me, I was actually stood in the spot and my dad had just been shot with, um, say, both barrels of a dull barrel shotgun. 
How we done it, I don't know. He managed to get up and stagger off down this gully. It's quite a steep sort of gully pathway, uh, the Cotswold Way. I almost had to decide, I thought, do I go down this gully? And someone kept saying, don't do that. Don't don't go down that gully. Get over this gateway. I don't know what it was. I, it was just, I don't know, something compelled me to do it. So, so I did. I started creeping down the grass. It kept really low. The grass was long. So I felt like I can hide in here. And then I got down by this plum tree. It was now gone. And the place has been developed a bit now. So it's quite a bit different. And I was listening. I was crouching in the, in the grass. I couldn't hear any at first. And then I could hear voices talking. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but just, just people whispering and talking. Then all of a sudden, my name was called out. Now, it was by, I knew it was straight away. It was Greg Moore, Terry Moore's son. He went, Lee? Now, being naive, I sort of thought, well, that's a familiar voice. Still didn't quite know what happened and not believing what, my, what did happen, you know, at the time. I got up and walked, up, got, got up, right, started to walk towards him. He walked off down, to, down this gully out of my sight. Now, there's no way on earth either walk back up because it was still, it wasn't dark, but it was like twilight. It was still, the, the light was still visible. And I was looking at this, there's like a single strand of barbed wire and I was looking, I was concentrating on that because I know what barbed wire can be like if you get caught up on your legs. And, I, and then, so he walked off. Not once did he walk back up, didn't see anybody. Just these voices and it all went quiet. I got over, went to get over this barbed wire fence and bang, and my right arm went back. And I just felt hot metal hitting my face, my whole body. It's like, it's like a, I felt it's like blast, like a hot blast. And then it was like my, my, my hips just turned before I even was even thinking and just, just ran. And I jumped off this bank, landed on this big pile of sand because they were doing building works at the time. And I just ran for my life. And I remember running. The worst thing was, because when that happens so quick, you're not expecting it. This, this, the worst bit was running away, waiting to be shot in the back because I felt so exposed because I was going down this driveway and I remember running tense in my back thinking I'm going to get one in the back any second and I run as fast as I can and by that time the ambulance was there down the bottom of this, this driveway and I remember just seeing blue lights, safety. That's the police or the ambulance. By the time I got there, the heavy squad, the right, whatever they were, they were all running up the lane with guns and stuff, you know, and the, 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 the arm response. But I ran into this guy's arms and that was, uh, turned out he was one of the neighbours, John Graham, who lived across the valley. And then I remember him saying to me, who's in the shooting? And I say, and he realised it was a young kid, he realised who I was. I said, I said, Greg and someone. He thought he said Greg and Simon, but I said, Greg and someone. Because from that, well, I thought at the time, later on that evening, I thought that his, it was his dad who shot me because he walked off and the shot came from where he'd been. It wasn't because this guy, John, whose arms I ran into, he actually told me that night in the police station that... Um, Terry Moore was stood with him when the second shot was fired. So I've known from that night till this day there was a third person involved. But after I ran into his arms, I was taken into his house with his wife. I didn't receive any treatment for the paramedics or anything. Um, they were dealing with my dad's body at the time, which I didn't know. Um, I had a, this gunshot room. But basically, I was caught with what I call a, a flyer, low-velocity pellet. When you fire a shotgun, you get some low-velocity flyers. flyers. The bulk of the shot had gone between my right arm and my body, so I was very lucky it went between there. Um, police were everywhere. And I remember, again, I'll tell you, it's the day I die. I remember going out into Penn Lane, and I saw an unmarked, which I believe was a red Fiesta, definitely a red car, I think it was a red Fiesta at the time. This bloke sat in the back, who I recognised as one of the mall's friends. And I looked at him in there, and he's really agitated. He goes, oh, I need a fucking piss, let me out, I need a piss, I need a piss. And I thought... The fuck's he doing here? You know, as a kid, what the fuck? this is weird. Still naive. You think, why is it? Do you know what I mean? It's so something to add up. And there's a, 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 a and I was mentioning this today. You're the police, and it's been mentioned loads of times. There's a, a female officer there, and I said to, her, "What's he doing here?" And she said, "Oh, we've picked him up for drunk and disorderly." I'll go back in the house. And whilst this was going on, they let him out of the car. She said he needed a piss, and he was walking up Penn Lane doing this. Fucks, fuck. Look, he saw me. And he's like, oh, fuck. Fuck's sake, no, no, hands on his head. And this this woman, this, this police officer, she said, go, go, just go back inside the house. So I sort of did what I was told and went back in the house. Now, I believe that this person was involved somewhere along the line. He was definitely involved. Because why why take somebody up to a scene of a shooting, drunk and disorderly to a scene of a shooting, and why is there no record of it? There's no record of it whatsoever. They've got no record of that car, the woman, the police officer, anything. No, there's no record of him being there at all. So... I was taken from there to Stroud Police Station, where I didn't, again, didn't receive any medical help. 
Um, yeah, it wasn't a, it wasn't a massive injury. It's just a little little hole with a little trickle of blood. You know, I didn't. It was only years later when they tried to see if there was a pellet in there. And um, I was sat with uh, this school teacher, John Graham, for a few hours. And then he was taken away, and I was left on my own for quite some time. I remember asking him. I said, because he apparently he knew he was told, but he wasn't allowed to tell me that my father had passed away. So then go forward a bit. I was in this. I think it was like six o'clock in the morning. I still didn't know what had happened to Dad or anything. I was taken back to my grandparents' house in Nailsworth, where my younger brother James was. Jim was there, and this was uh, again. I, I'm gonna struggle with this. <clears throat> we were sat in there. My grandfather came to pick me up from Strand Police Station. The police had told him. Um, he served uh, for the country in the Second World War, like a lot of our grandparents did. Fair play to him. I was sat. The police said, "Look, take a seat." And my brother was in the room, and, they, uh, and he said to me, um, "You've had a, you've had a bad night, you know. I'm afraid you've had bad news. What's happened to you? But you've got to now prepare yourself for some more bad news." And he said, "I'm afraid your father's." <sighs> My friend, your father has passed away in the result of the shooting. And it's like, fuck. I can't describe it. It's like tunnel. It's like you, you, you shoot back in a, in a, in a like tunnel. And, I was, and James, uh, Jim, James' brother, we were talking about it the other day. It's like, it's like shooting back a million miles an hour. And he's like, there. It's, just, it's, it's a really weird sensation. And that was it. It's like. Did you believe it? No. It's just, try and get your head round it, you know what I mean? He's been shot, you know, he's, he's not coming back, he's, he's dead, he's passed away. No. And even when, when someone at the mortuary, there's <laughs> uh, a fucking, 14, a vulnerable, skinny little 15 year old kid. I looked at that poor bloke led there, thought, as long as I can die. Put my hand on his forehead, and it was cold. <laughs> And I swear, and, it, and his cousin said, I swear he winked. There's no wink. Because if anybody would have the last laugh, he would. You know? And I remember standing there, and I fucking... The, the fucking rage. It was, it was just internal. I'm going to get you fuckers. I don't care how fucking long it takes me. I'm fucking coming for you. Every fucking one of you. I don't care. And the last breath in my body one way or other those motherfuckers are going to get it the hardest fucking thing for me in my life is not killing every single one of them and every single fucking who I believe is involved with it you know I've had to think of my mum begged me please Lee think of your brothers think of think of me because when you have I said to my dad's best friend's sister once, I said, I remember sitting down there, like I say, you feel so vulnerable as a 14-year-old little kid. Oh, poor lad, you know, and then, you know, what's he going to do? And I remember sitting there saying, yeah, I'm 14 now, but I won't be fucking 14 forever. Fucking knew it, you know. And the, do you know what the satisfying thing about it now? We're all getting older. I feel still feel fucking good, and i got fucking rage in me. It feels like the incredible Hulk. And, 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 and this is why I took up boxing. Is knowing that those 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 gutless colours in the palm of my hand. That any time I want to do it, any time I want to fucking do it, I can do it. Any fucking time, I can. F the thoughts I had again, read and they come back, and I'm I, I, I don't know how Lana should do it. I believe there's there's some bigger picture in life. I'm not religious, but I got a spiritual connotation about stuff because there's some weird <laughs> shit that's happened to me. I got to be honest, that it sort of keeps me on the level. And then most of the time, and I've been in a great place. But every so often it comes back and it comes back. But the, the satisfying thing, knowing that it, they're like that, you're, you're there, you're in the palm of my hand, and any time I want to do it, I could, I fucking could. I, I when I do it, use I'd do it with bare hands. But where does it get you at the end of the day? That's the thing. But it's still there. It's still there. It's still there, and it's the, the, the satisfying thing. See, you're right. You fuckers now are gonna feel my pain, and your family's gonna feel my pain. 
You know, they've got kids and stuff. Now, they're, they're, they're going to feel my pain, you know, because that don't go away. And all those, those corrupt coppers, that is corrupt. They've covered it up. They're going to they're gonna find out. Their family's going to find out they were in on this. You know, what's happened to their legacy? Oh, he's a wonderful detective. No, he's a He's corrupt. He took a backhand. He took a bone. And there's probably people in there who have done exactly the same as well. Took a bone. And that's one thing about my dad. He'd never take a bone. If he thought a mate of his was going to something happen to him, he'd be the first one to be there for him and tell him, warn him, and be there with, walk there with him. You know? And it makes you wonder if there's friends around him at the time who didn't. You know, took 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 a phone call and couldn't even warn him or something, or something might happen, you know? Couldn't even warn him. Because the bottom line is, when they fucking ambushed him that night, he put his hands up and they admitted saying it. You're on my land with guns, I'm going to get the police. What did he do then? Well, we, he walked away from us. How soon after the shooting did Terry get arrested? Um, I'm not quite sure. It would have been... But he did get arrested. He, oh, yeah, he, got, he did get arrested. They were, they were originally charged with premeditated murder. That was the original charge, because they conspired. They bought the shotguns the same day. They went in and see a friend of theirs, and, and again, this needs to be looked at, and, and said, oh, I've got these brand new guns. On the same day, their best friend... Did they get put on remand? Got put on remand for, I think it was nine months, nine, eleven months on remand. And then it never even got to the jury. It got kicked out for insufficient evidence. Didn't even go to the jury. We've never had a trial where it's gone to a draw. We had a civil trial in 2002 and everything was overturned. Everything was overturned. We had new evidence, it was just overturned. It never went to a jury. A crept bread. The thing is, the judge, Justice Martin Morbick, worked on the um, Grenfell Towers and we know how that turned out. Same bent judge. You know, he just overturned everything. It's ridiculous. You know, I had people following it. People came there completely impartial to it all and said, it was obviously murder, you know, you ought to get thousands of pounds. It's never been about the money, it's about justice. I said, well, it's justice we want. Not money, it's justice. That was the only way to get it back in court. And they said, well, it's obvious it's murder. It's obvious. It all got overturned. Every single bit of evidence overturned, overturned, overturned. How? You tell me. What was their, what was Terry's defence? Self-defence. It's just got so many holes on it. They basically try to say that they come across my dad, um, he went to grab hold of the gun, Terry Moore's gun, and there a wrestle and a match ensued. Now, Terry Moore was a lot smaller than my dad. Uh, he probably was 19, 20 years older. Um, he had arthritis in his knees, you know, because they always said, why don't you just walk across the field? Because they could have seen my dad where he was, just walk across the field, but they didn't. They drove up behind him to ambush him. His excuse was he had arthritis, but he, man he still managed to have a wrestling match over a gun and stuff, do you know what I mean? So Greg Moore said, this is what he said, that... My dad and his dad were wrestling over the gun and he had the gun at his hip and just shot my dad from like between, they said between three and 12 feet away. So my barrister said that this is in the civil trial because I didn't hear this in the criminal trial because I was underage and I gave evidence, but I didn't hear this part of it. Now, there was no blood, bone or tissue at all on Terry Moore, not a rip shirt. There's no fingerprints on my dad's gun. They even tried to make out that the gun was bent and to try and carry, oh, there was a struggle. So if that was true, well, Terry Moore, well, my dad would have to be Superman to bend the gun like that. Do you know what I mean, Terry Moore would have to be just as strong to hold the other end of it. Now, if you're stood there, now shotguns, I don't know if you're how familiar you are with shotguns, but you've got a spray. Now, wouldn't, my, my barrister said to um, Gray Moore, he said, weren't you worried about, you, you said you fired the gun from your hip. Weren't you worried about hitting your own father? And he couldn't answer it. What was, his, what was Terry's reason for having a gun? To defend their property, defend their land. They said they went up there to take uh, to defend their land because they believed that Mr. Ives was taking the fence down. So both him and his son were armed with shotguns. So on, on, on the Taz land, and we proved that anyway, on a public footpath with two loaded and lodged shotguns. So that they, to go back to the grave, fired the gun off, Reloaded that same gun. I was shot the same gun 20 minutes later. Now, if you shot somebody accidentally in self defense, you'd be like, fuck, drop it on the ground, not reload the fucking thing. And then, and then shoot a 14 year old kid 20 minutes later, or anybody 20 minutes later. And again, this was on a public footpath. And how did they justify the second shooting? Oh, it, uh, apparently it was on the floor and he was fiddling around in the grass trying to find the gun and it went off accidentally. And yet I was on a higher bit of ground. It's impossible. It's a, my ballistics expert, ballistics expert at the time, Dr. Frank Swan, right? He worked on the Omar bombing and stuff. He said, for that to hit you like they said it did, we'd have to go and hit the moon, ricochet off the moon and coming at you. He said, that was, that was a direct aim from the shoulder at you. That was a direct line of fire. Still overturned. Well, that's, overturned. to me, that sounds like they were shooting to kill. Yeah, 100%. Uh, uh, yeah. Could have blown your guts out. Yeah, it could have done. The, 
my memory, I got into a bit of trouble when I was a kid. We, we all don't. And then, rightfully so, you know, because I just, yeah, fuck the law. John, what, what's, what's it done for us? It's, a, it's, a, it's an ass. It's a joke. So I, it was something minor, riding a motorbike round when I was 15 with, put my brother's tax disc in. I got all the half, but his tax disc in, right? And I got caught for that. Anyway, um, they, my mum had to go down to the Stonehouse Police Station. And the guy down there said, I was a chief firearms officer that night. He said, your son's very lucky, he said, if, well, he said, if Greg was a better shot, it wasn't Greg who shot me, but he said, if he's a better shot, you'd be burying your son that day. That's what he said. Mm. You know, because, and, and my bliss expert told me all those years later, the shot actually went between, passed between your right arm and your torso, your, your body. And there was evidence that they bought those guns that day? Yeah, yeah, Gloucester Sports. So they went up there, knowing that it wasn't their land, with unlicensed shotguns, and basically shot some of me dead and got away with it and praised for it. And the whole land situation, who actually owned it, they, by that stage, they, they must have known that it wasn't actually their land. Oh, they knew all right. Surely. Yeah, Council yeah. interference. Yeah, yeah. Well, you tell me. It was our land. We, we owned it. My dad owned the land, the local businessman, Alan Smith. He had half. My dad had half. It was our land. You know, they knew that as well. So we, this all went to court after my dad had been murdered and we proved all along that it was our land all, all along. He had no right or reason to be there. And he didn't even show up in court anyway. See, the thing with it is, and you can look at conspiracy theories, you, you see. And what we all knew what, what do you think happened? Well, I think the dad was in people's way. And I think they all conspired. We, we, you, you do the dirty work and we'll look after you. That's one theory. Whose way was he in? Well, there's, you've got the Freemasons. They're, they're world, world renowned, you know. And people say, oh, no, they're not Masons. There's nothing to do with that, blah, blah. They do a lot for charity. I said, well, funny enough it is. I remember a business, businessman telling me once, he said, you do good things for charity. They won't rise against you. In other words, you put a bit of money in the church, you know, if you want to build something somewhere, people, oh, he's all right, let him get away with that because he puts money in the church. You know, so it's a good cover, isn't it? Do stuff for charity, then all the jiggery poker, you turn a blind eye to all that. So that's one theory. Another theory is, and again, again it sounds all conspiracy and this, that, and the other, but who knows what's the truth? Uh, it was that, it was some, something to do with the government. It was in the Merchant Navy. Um, there's ties, he has something to do with GCHQ. If he's a spy, is he getting immunity? You speak to somebody in the area, they're like, oh, you know, you don't want to worry about all that. It's, you, you get on with your life. Anybody outside the area, they say, oh, I had a fuck to get away with that. I fucked that to my last breath. So, what's going on? And this, is, a, th on? this is all documented as well. It's all documented. Well, not about uh, the, the guy who had the Terry's him. defense, should I say? What, as in? As in turning up with no intention to kill. He took it up for self-defence because he thought yeah, yeah, he, might, he, might, he, he must have thought your your dad was armed. Yeah. Otherwise, he wouldn't. You can't justify taking one. Well, no, he, he knew my dad was armed because they saw him. You know, he knew my dad wasn't that way. But he just he just saying he. But that was that was his defence. We took it for self-defence in case there's any trouble. That's what he said. You know, and again, there was at least three 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 men that night. At least three perpetrators. And letting off two shots accidentally. Two shots accidentally on the same night. Twenty yeah. minutes apart. 20 minutes apart in one night. So the CPS yeah. thought there was enough evidence to charge. Premed with premeditated murder. And like I said, it didn't even get to the jury. And then remand for nine months. Yeah. And then it didn't make it to court. Got to court. It was in court. Then I, get, I stood up in court and gave... Didn't make it to trial, so sorry. Didn't make, yeah, it didn't get to the jury. So tell me about what happened in court. I wasn't actually, because as a minor, I, mm. I, only, I only came in to give evidence uh, when I stood up in the dock. Now, the police ran me down there, the detectives, before the case to get me used to the Bristol Crown Court, but being a minor. They categorically said to me, they're not allowed to cross-examine you because you're a minor. <laughs> that went out the window. This Powroy, you know, he um, cross-examined... I got my own back years later, though, in the, in the civil trial, but he was there trying to make out I was a liar. He gave me a load of trick questions. He's this, that, and I was going... No, 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 no to all these questions. No, 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 no. We're on, on and on and on. And they said, Greg Moore didn't call your name out, did he? Expect me to say no. I said, yes, he did. Trying to trick, trick, me, trick me up, you know. Wouldn't treat you very well, but that's life, isn't it? You know, it, it's, it's, I did it, got in court, saw the murderers in front of me. Uh, phew, you know, it's just I'm dreadful, isn't it? Would a kid go through that this day and age, you know? So while Terry and his son were on remand, yeah. and you know that there's, well, in your mind, there's there's a trial coming. Yeah. I mean, I've never heard of such a thing, not making it into trial. Yeah. Getting thrown out. Getting thrown out. Ins insufficient evidence. Got thrown out insufficient evidence. Man, it's, but did your brief say to you, you can expect a conviction? Or to I your think, mum? I think they were, were all expecting that. And at the time, I'd, um, 
I was working at the Cotswold Falconry Centre in a place called Morton the Marsh with Birds of Prey. I love Birds of Prey. And I was over there and it was good for me to get away um, because of everything going on after I gave evidence. And that was when my mum came over and told me that they did, they got away with it. They'd been acquitted. Yeah. yeah. So you would have been 15, 16 15, by now? 15, I was still 15 then. Yeah. How does a 15-year-old even process that? I mean, an, an adult would struggle to process that. I'm struggling to process that, and I've got no emotional tie to it. I can't believe that that was not, it didn't go to trial. I, I, I sat, I sat there. I remember we were in that back room at the Falconry Centre. I remember saying, "Look, Lee, I've got," a, and, and she just started crying. She said, "She said, Lee, they've got away with it." And my youngest brother, he, I think he punched a window or something at the time. So I don't know. It's a, it's a difficult thing to process. It's like, um, well, you've got two choices. You have a sink or swim, I suppose. I got a soldier on that. I got to be a man. I became a man overnight. It changed my mentality. Mm. Changed overnight. I didn't want to be at school anymore. And you were the oldest, weren't you? Yeah, and it's just like I felt vulnerable being at school. I was looking. They all of a sudden, everybody looked like kids, and I felt like I was an adult all of a sudden. It was really weird. It's a defence mechanism. That's what mm. it is. You become you become the man of the house. Yeah, you become the man of the house, and we, they carried on victimising us after that as well. I'm assuming that they they got out of jail from being on remand and moved yes. straight back into their straight house. Straight back into the house. So you're now neighbours again. Yeah, yeah, now neighbours again. And there's quite a, a gap between our houses. It's not as if we sort of... You'd see them drive out the driveway and we had a big tall hedge. But even so, like, it's just, you know, they're back, they're back living there. It's hard to process. It's hard to process. Was there any restraining orders put in place? No, nothing at all. So you're free to... Yeah, go along and blow past off. each other. Yeah. My uncle, my dad's brother said, look, whatever you do, don't get doing anything. We're going to get this back in court. We do this the right way. We get it back in court, blah, blah, blah. And as a kid, you still got faith in the system. Because you're naive. Mm. When there's something so black and white, and people are telling you that as well, mind. People older than you, you know, you think, well, they're the adults, they, should, they know better than me, what do I know? Um, yeah, we get, we get this right, we, we, we do all this. And there's people who might watch this, and there's people that, oh, if that's my dad, I've done this. They don't know what it's like when it's in that situation. A lot of people, I mean, they have a fight, and they, and they do this, that, and the other. Do you know I mean? They're full of shit, mm. you know? What were the Chinese whispers around that time, once they're out? Um... Well, the, the, I know for a fact that Greg Moore, he was down at the local nightclub it, it, called Egypt Mill, bragging about it. My cousin was down there at the time, my dad's brother's son. He's a very passive guy, you know. Um, if he, he, he's, he if he's pushed, he, he, could have a, he could have one. Like, he's strong, but he's just very, very passive. And he had to leave the place because he was in the in the toilets, this Greg Moore, bragging, oh, yeah, when I was inside and all this, and thought he was the big I am, thought he was clever, and there was a few people buying him drinks and stuff. Because people like that... People do sort of gravitate towards people who've got a bit of notoriety. You know, Especially don't. in a little village. In a little village like that, you know. People were sort of saying there's going to be a lot of repercussions, no repercussions at all. My dad worked with a lot of Irish people in, in groundworks and stuff, and he got on really well with the Irish, you know. Um, we had a phone call one night. My brother Patrick answered the phone, and, uh, and the Irish face said, this is another example of British justice. If you want to do something about this, we can. And he said, well, you better speak to my mum. Um, my mum spoke to them and she spoke to a, a neighbour who was Irish. She said, look, don't get involved because you'll never get rid of them. They'll want something back in return. When I was 17, and she said, well, we're trying to do this the right way. My, dad, my, my, my brother-in-law said, we're gonna, Adam is going to get this sorted out and get it done the right way. When I was 17, I was approached on a building site by a guy and he said, are you Tony's boy? I said, yeah. He said, oh, yeah, Tony's a nice lad. And I remember always thinking that, lad, he, he's a man. He's, it just seemed funny at 17 to hear that. And he said, look, we can, get, we can get this sorted out, he says, you know. We've got, we've got friends in, in Ireland who can get this sorted out. We, your dad was very well thought of, you know. He's a hard-working guy. He was, he was a tough man, honest man. We can get this sorted out. And I said, look, well, my uncle said, we've got to do this the right way. And I respect him. This is what my uncle said. So we didn't go down that, down, down that road. What was the process after that? The legal process? The, the idea then was to get it for a, a civil trial. Do you know, look, it took me nine years to get that back into us. It's just for a civil trial. From I was 18 to I was 27. In the meantime, I'd taken up boxing and ever and ever stuff. Um, and that fell flat. The civil trial, I said, they had all the evidence, everything was overturned. And it took all that time. And that I was legally aided. I had to pay, I can't remember, like, was it 50 quid a month towards legal aid, legal aid to try and push it and try and keep myself out of trouble. Well, I didn't. I got, in, I got into trouble with stuff. And it's understandable. I thought, oh, you know... <laughs> Oh, you know, you've got to keep your nose clean, blah, blah, blah. But when you've got all that going around in your head, do you know what I mean? It's a, it's a difficult, a young bloke, and you're out having drinks, and, you know, out with your mates and all that sort of stuff. And that's where boxing was my saviour, you know. What was life like in the village for you during those eight years? 
it was all right, you know. Um, well, we did move out. We moved from there. I was about 21 because I, I assaulted. I went along there. I was 19. I went along to kill him, to be honest. Was you going to kill Terry or oh, the son? Oh, yeah, kill them all. Yeah, dude, a lot of them. I was, that was it. They're having it, a lot of them. Yeah, what happened? Well, basically, I, I came home and they, they'd sabotaged something. It was, it was, it was a my dad's crawler, Ford's a major crawler. It had been sabotaged. So I thought, right, them fuckers are having it. That's it now. And I got down. Mum said she knew something was wrong, something was up. And then I just went along and she and she said, I knew where you were going. And if it weren't for Mum, it would probably been a different story. And I saw Terry Moore out on his, in his guard messing around with his tractor. And I said, he said, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? I said, you should have fucking thought about that before he was on my dad's land and fucking murdered him four, four and a half years ago. And, there's, and I sort of looked at him and, it, and, I, and I, I just can't explain how I felt. It's like, here we go. He's, this is it. And he had an iron bar in his hand. And I didn't have need to have an excuse to do him. I didn't. But it was what made it more satisfying is he had, he had something in his hand. Because I thought, I'm, I'm, you look small to me now. I'm a fucking man. I grew really quick. I was a 90-year-old man. I was about, about 14 and a half stone or something. And I'm thinking, it was almost like in a short couple of years, I changed from this little skinny, vulnerable child to a fucking man. And I remember looking at him, and it, it was almost like when he looked at me, it's like looking at the fucking devil. The look in his face, and his face changed, and he came at me. And remember he came at this bar. I swear he could have hit me straight between the eyes, and it wouldn't have done anything. He had that full of adrenaline. And I remember just right hand straight in his head. As he went down, dropped a knee into him, and he was just flat out on the floor. He was, he, was, he was gone on the floor. And I stood over him, and his wife jumped on my back. Now, she, she drove him up there that night. Now, I've never hit a woman. And I didn't actually. I just shrugged her off. And I turned around and I started losing. I saw my mum and he punched me on mum. And I saw it was my mum and I held back. And then I was just so full of fucking rage. And I looked at him and I wanted to stamp all over him. I'm not, I don't kick people on the floor, but it's like I could just, oh, like now I could just fucking pull them to pieces. That's what it felt like. And mum was there and Lee, please don't, 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 don't. And it's like, fuck, I'm full of adrenaline. I'm, I'm fucking raging. I'm fucking want to kill somebody. I want to kill somebody. You know, it's it, the, the, the rage. It's, you, it's hard to explain. I'm going to fucking kill them all. So I picked this garden gnome up and I went to throw it through the window. I threw it that hard. It just went, almost went over the top of the roof and hit the apex. I was pissed off because it didn't go through the window because I threw it too hard. And then I, I, remember, I remember it was in the court statement. So I turned around and said, I'm going to fucking kill you all. You better get me fucking done in soon. So I kill you and all your mates in the fucking free movies, you crap bastards. You murdered my dad. Fuck the lot of you. Mummy, please go, please go. And I just, I remember I made a, had a vest on and I, I think it got ripped slightly from his wife jumping on my back. And then I went along back to my my house and I knew now that the old bill was going to turn out. The police, they're going to, they're, they're, they're on their way and I was ready for it. Yeah, I was ready for it, ready for it. So you still, you're 19 years old, you got all this anger, rage pumping for your body. And I remember I went back down to the garden path. Mum said, look, just calm down, calm down, I'll make you a cup of tea. I wasn't, I was just, just stoic, I suppose, just switched off, but ready. And I remember I got the, there's a, we had a pub bench, and I remember turning it round and facing it towards our garden path. Then I saw the riot van turn out, I thought, right, you fucking cunt, you're having it. That's it, right? And I thought, here we fucking go. They're, 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 this is the reason why I'm, this has all happened. I think they, they've covered this up, they haven't done their job properly, we're having it. Anyway, two police officers came down, I recognised, um, I think it was Duncan Arinze, DC Arinze, and uh, Ray Pitt. And then I recognised them. And they said, look, Lee, calm down. Are you all right? No, I'm not all right. He said, look, there's, there's, there's a lot of coppers. We've told them to stay in there, in that van, because they're itching to come along. They said, send the fuckers along. Send them along. No, we don't want to do that. Let's, let's just calm down. We'll talk about this. And he got on the... He got like I was looking at. I remember looking because it's quite a long path, and I could see the van there. And he got on the radio and fair play, they, they sent him away, you know. And when they was being decent, it did calm me down. It did calm me down. It was like Lee, we're we're on your side. We're not we're not your enemy. We're on your side. And then I got to, I got we got arrested. I got arrested. They didn't handcuff me to be fair. Took me off um, to Dursley Nick. How badly damaged was Terry? Uh, it, to be fair, not enough. He only had a bit of a lump on his head and that. He, re he reckoned, it, we saw these pictures, his big black eye and his knee was gone and all this bollocks. You know what I mean? It's like my uncle said, you think, you know, he, he should be on gladiators at the time. He said, he wrestles with your dad, he fights with you and all this bollocks. And I didn't do a good enough job on him, nowhere near. You know? Did I you get charged? Yeah, I did. I got charged. I got charged with ABH. Jail? Um, no. I um, got off with common assault in the end. Did Terry um, press charges? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he went all the way. With yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Well, he, did, he got as far as the magistrate court because it's a complete mockery. We probably got more in the magistrate court than we did in the criminal court. 
back then. So he, he wanted you to go to jail for it, though? Oh, yeah, he did all right, yeah. Yeah, that's what he liked. No, the bloke's a psychopath. He got no empathy whatsoever. He even said to my brother once, oh, morning, James, how are you? After murdering his dad, mind. Mm. You know, you know it's like, in his head, it's like he, he thought he was doing, doing you a favour. You see what I mean? He just murdered your dad, and he's like that. When I, even when I approached him that time, when I looked at him, it, it was almost like the look in his face was like, what's your problem? And you moved in the end, not them? Yes. Yeah, we, we moved. We had to move. Because after that, moment, it's, it's going to escalate. It, it, was quite, it was quite to stay where he was. Yeah, he was. After, after what happened. After, after what happened. Yeah, murdered their father, you know, and then he tried, he tried on them and all sorts, you know, in the, in the past. You know, and he's done it since, the, well, he's dead now, but he did it to people. It was all, it's all come out, you know, over the years, you know. And what did you do in Western Supermare? I'm not proud of this. I'm really, I'm really not now looking back at it because they've probably got families now and I'd like to shake their hands one day. But... I, I was very hyper vigilant. I was always defending my friends. Any injustice or anything like that. It's just, I just looking back at it now as, a, as an adult, you sort of think, I can see why I was like that. We was, again, it, was, it, was a, it was a bank holiday weekend, and I was with my mate Jason, a few of us, and we was in this nightclub, Mr. B's nightclub, it was. And um, he'd been seeing this girl, they'd been dating for quite some time, and then she was doing something with this other lad from Western Supermare. And then there's never a girl at the time, and she goes, look, I know what you're watching, just keep that in any of your business and all. I said, look, we're outnumbered here. Anyway, before the, the night ended, I went out in the road first. I was, I was 18 years old. I went out the road first. I thought, I'm going to watch what's going on here, see who's coming out and weigh it all up, so I said, right. So I went out first, and I never really drank that much, but then, to sort of have a few, and then if I got a bit tipsy, I was always sort of want to keep my wits about me. Anyway, I saw these, these group of lads crowding around this girl, and then I said, and I, I saw Jay, mate Jason there, and then I saw she had this jacket and she's wrapped around one of these lads, and I saw him saying something, looking over at mate Jason, and Jason, he's not a fighter at all. And then oh, I don't know what it was, some, one, one looked at me, and I sort of walked towards, he walked towards me, and he said something, and I can't remember what he said. And then bang, he had it, just uppercut, wallet. Then the next one, bang, and then I punched one, mate, left hook, and he went over, oh, sorry, pulled, tried to pick him up, and then the first one was back up again, hit him again, knocked him out, they both sparkled on the floor. And then you're looking around, who's, who else having it? There? You, you're in that, it's like, you're just in that, it's weird, you're in that zone. You know, it's just, anybody's been in that situation would know, would know what it's like. You're sort of, you're aware of your, your old surroundings, what's going on, you're in the zone. You must have been a ticking time bomb anyway. I was, exa exactly what I was. And then my mate, God bless his soul, he's dead now, Mickey Carey, a lot of time for that guy. Little guy, little guy, real powerful, strong guy. He, he was a Marine. And obviously through his training, he was switched on, he could run over and leave, we gotta go, we gotta go. Got me out of there. And we got in, the, got in the car and then we, we hit, we went to the beach somewhere. And anyway, my, my, it was my right fist was starting to swell up from this guy's teeth. Anyway, um, we went to a local hospital and I just didn't give a fuck. We went to this local hospital and I didn't care about the repercussions whatsoever. I was ready to take the old lot on. We went there and we sat in there and of course, these two guys walked in and I saw these two guys on a stretcher unconscious in the place, in this hospital. And I'm sort of sat down there, and then this, this nurse approached to chat to me. She said, what happened to your hand? I said, oh, I fell out of the van. She said, oh, that's quite a bad injury, is he? I've been a bit, a bit, a little bit drunk. I said, fell out of the top of his van and hurt my hand. And then these other lads are in there, and they, they, were, they, they, they must have <coughs> recognised me. I don't know, because they just said, well, what are you in here for? I said, what are you in here for? They said to me, I said, oh, I fell out of the van and hurt my hand. What are you in here for? Oh, we, um, there's some lunatic from Australia come out and bashed two of our mates. I was like, oh, oh, did he? Still then, I just thought, my mate, my mate Paul, he said, Lee, we got to go, mate. They sat on a cess. I said, I ain't fucking going anywhere. Well, they can have it as well if they want. It's weird, you know, didn't care. Did you get arrested? No. Got away with it? Got away with it at the time. Got away with it. I just didn't care. And he kept on leaving. We got to make this. I don't care. Let's have it. And I'd be right. Fuck it. Think, I didn't get two boots. Didn't care. Live, die, what, didn't matter. And did that fearless self-destruct mode carry on? Yeah, it did. It did. And then I, I left there. And it wasn't until I assaulted with Terry Moore, they called me in for it. And they said, look, we want to answer, ask, ask you about a situation. I said, I did it. Yeah, it was me. Well, yeah, it was me. And I think the officer at the time was trying to, you know, trying to sort of thing. Because there was some there was sympathy, some sympathy towards what happened to the family because it's, it's corrupt. And, 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 and there's, some, there's still, there's some coppers out there, they're human beings in the day, and some are trying to do a fucking job in the day. Um, so I admitted doing it. But at that time, I wanted to go to prison. And, and a part of me wanted to go. I didn't care. Did you wish it ever come true? No, it didn't. You know, and I think what it was, I was seeing that to see a probation officer and he said, he tried to put the scare tactics on me and he said to me, um, do you realise they're looking at a custodial sentence? And uh, what do you think about that? I said, what? I said, well, let me tell you something. When my 
Both my grandparents were 19 years old. They were fighting the Second World War. Seeing their mates get blown up. They've been to school with shot, stabbed, blown to pieces. You know, they've come back with PTSD. They got on with it. You didn't see them moaning. I had families and stuff. At 19, I said, what's fucking prison compared to that? What's that? What? There's no comparison. You, know, you think that's going to worry me? No, nah, send me there. I think that got me off it. Mm. So I went to Woodsbury Magistrates Court and basically said the similar thing to them in there. You know, they, they, I explained the situation, why I did it. I thought it was self-defense. I was being hyper-vigilant, trying to protect my friends. You know, and I did think they was going to get attacked. And I got, I think I got, yeah, I got two ABH charges and was on... Um, I'd see a probation officer for two years, I think, and uh, I can't have had community service at that time or not. Well, go into more detail about the civil trial that, again, fell through. How did that fall through they, the net? Again, every, all the people who came there and witnessed that could not believe it. Could not believe it. Not, not a second time. And you, was, you time. was present? I was present. I gave evidence. I was 27 then. I gave evidence in, in court. Um, and I think I gave a good, a good enough account of myself and went through everything. But again, it's just like, what a fucking mockery! What a what a fucking joke! Do you know what I mean? You got you got a bent you got a bent blisters expert in there trying to make out it's possible to bend the gun, You're making yourself look an idiot in there. It's just it was just it's beyond the joke. And when this was all going on, people people listened to it. Was he was he on? So, was there a viewing gallery there? There was, yeah, yeah. That's so, what we got. There was a viewing gallery. So there. the public yeah, actually gallery. witnessed yeah, that for themselves. Yeah, in disbelief. In disbelief. In, in absolute absolute disbelief. And when he overturned the verdict, I, I'll be honest now, I'll be honest now, and part of me regrets it again. It's probably a good thing or a bad thing. I remember looking at Greg Moore, looking down at him, I thought, right, if this goes pear shit, you're having it, mate. I had it all planned in my head. There's behind me, there's a, there's like a, 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 like a gallery thing. I don't know what it's for. It was like, it, it was, it was a cage with glass, like glass doors. And I thought I could get, I could drag him in there, get him in a really naked choke. I can prop my feet against the doors, jam it shut. I thought he'd be dead by the time they get in at me. And that was what was going through my head. And then when he started reading that summer, summer that I thought, right, I've got this is my time, this is my chance, though he's having it. Then my uncle, it's, it's all it's weird because he he said to me, fuck this. No, he, 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 I'll give me his due, he never swears, very rare. He said, let's get out, I'm not listening to this shit. That's what he said, let's get out of here. And then I I missed my opportunity. I sort of got up and listened to him. He's he's my dad's brother, he's respect him and all that. I walked behind him, I walked behind that Greg Moore, and I missed my opportunity. I looked. So it's don't, don't, it was like weird. It was like, a, don't do it, fucking don't do it, don't do it. And it was so, so close. I was so, it was that easy. I was so close. It was that easy. It was that easy. And we, we got outside and then I just started getting a rage and I went in the toilet, punching the toilet, doing this, doing that, and kicking stuff and nobody said anything and let me have a little bit of a tantrum. And then I came back in and thought, right, should we go back in there and just do them all, just do the judge and like, me, oh, calm down. And my brother goes, Jim, Lee, he goes, they said, Jim, what are you going to do? I'm going to do whatever Lee does. Oh, he's at me, but he's always had my back. And then, um, luckily, there's some of my dad's friends there. And they said, look, let's just calm down. Great, so this ain't going to get you nowhere. You're going to get banged up. You get banged up. But at the time, it just feel, feels worth it. Do you know what I mean? But then my mum's there and that. And then all, and then all of a sudden, you have, big, you have a big, like, I can't explain. You have, like, a big dump. It's just, like, adrenaline dump. And it's like, fuck, so you're outside. And I'm just, I get, I just get in disbelief. I just can't believe it's happening. You've not lost hope yet, yeah, have you? No, I haven't. No, exactly, you, you've, I haven't. You've not lost hope. No, I haven't. 34 years on? 34 years on, 34 yeah. years on and you're yeah. still fighting for justice. Yeah. When I came out of that trial, I had two choices. I went back to my grandmother's house, um, sat there, and I've got, I've got two choices now. I was 27 years old. I thought, right, it's either got, I go down the road, sort it out myself, and just, just do just do burn for it, just do time for it. Or at the time, I, had a, I was... I was a, Persian professional boxer. I mean, he had a short amateur career, but I was training in Bristol with the likes of it was Glenn Catley, who's WPC uh, Super Middleweight Champion at the time. Um, so I was doing a lot of training with him, sparring with him, was his main sparring partner at one stage. And then Chris Sanager was my, uh, my manager. He said, Look, you know, you've got a good potential here, you know. Um, so I, I remember sitting there, I thought, I've got two choices. Being a professional, when I first got my pro license, it was, it was, it was, like, it was a nice little achievement. I'm now a professional boxer. I can get him paid for something I love doing, you know. Tremendous achievement. It's, you know, it was, it was really nice. Fair you know? play. And then um, we're sparring with people at that level and he brings you on. It can only get you better. There's times I turn up at a dream, gym, and think, fuck, you know. It was from going from amateur to even like boxers, heavyweight, super heavy as an amateur. But you go into the pro game, it's a different level, especially world class fighters. There's levels in that game. And it was like, I remember trying to get, get, get a jab on Glenn when we first started sparring. It was an achievement. Just trying to land a jab because it's just inches and movements and stuff. But anyway, I thought, my cousin was sat there and she said, Lee, you know, your dad wouldn't want you to do this. 
think about it. You know, you got two choices, and I thought, yeah, she's right. I, have, I thought, right, if I can do well at the boxing, every fight I have, I can mention it about my dad. I can, I can do more outside the ring, or sorry, more inside the ring than I can more in there than I can in prison. You know, what can I do in the nick? Do you know what I mean? People feel sorry for five minutes, and that's it. Get a few letters. And I see he's love bang, and they forget about it. Move on, my life, fair enough. So that's what I did. I started focusing all my intent on boxing, you know. And every fight I got, if I won a title, uh, I'd dedicate it to my dad, you know. And some people say, to, oh, you got to do this for yourself. I'm fucking, I'm doing it for myself. It's a double-edged sword. You know, I love it. And at the same time, when you achieve something, you get something, local press, you can mention what I'm my dad, you know, what I'm to him. And you get it out that way as well. And at the same time, it, leaves, it alleviates that frustration. A lot of people, mate, they would have gone down a very different route. I mean, I, yeah. I speak to hundreds of people. I've got friends that... It doesn't take a much to go completely off the rails. Yeah. So you, you're not telling me that you that you were injecting heroin or no, drinking no. yourself to death. I've never, I've never, I've never taken steroids. Never taken any drugs at all. Um, I can't speak the same for my brothers, but we're all got our little vices. I like a drink, but when you have got a good role model, that makes hell of a difference. Now a lot of kids ain't got that these days. They ain't got a good proper man to put you on the straight and narrow. Do you know what I mean? I only had him for 14 years, but I was enough. Mm. You know, it was the quality. Anybody can be a dad, not many people can be a father. And that's the difference. And because of the way he was, and he was such a, a massive uh, impact on my life, is where I've probably done what I've done. But I've also got to say, I've always had a very um, supportive mum as well. You know, hated me boxing because she won't be in her, which mums did, but still supported me. You know? oh, even more so yeah. after losing her husband. Yeah, she absolutely. doesn't want to yeah. lose her son. Yeah, when I was in the cage fight, it was like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, but she knew that I had to do these things, you know, I had to do these things. Much better route than self-destruct. <sighs> it, it is, you know, and, and I did achieve some title fights, you know, and uh, uh, boxer eliminated for the British title. But the problem for me was, was making the weight, you know, getting, I could get down to, to the light heavyweight, but sustaining that and then... Do you like your food? I fucking love my food, mate. Same. And, and people say, how the hell do you get down to that weight? It's like, people recognise me, you mm. know? But a lot of cardio, a lot of running, and I realised I lost a lot of muscle bulk, so it, 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 at the same time, I lost a lot of power doing that. You don't you don't feel like you have at the time when you look back on it, and then you start doing pads with people when you get slightly heavier, because you know yourself, with a, with a boxing game, you know, you've got to... It's a fight. It's a science to it. They more so now. There's a science to it. get that perfect weight right. So, your your optimum fighting condition. It's like what I've done falconry with birds of prey. When you get your bird at the perfect weight, it's a bit like a boxer got his fighting weight. When you when you your birds at the perfect weight, muscle and fat, it's optimum. But you go too far either way, you're not at the best place. You know? It's so nice to hear someone tell me that they. They went down the fighting route. They went. They 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 lost themselves in a gym rather than yeah. down the, the bottom yeah. of a bottle. Yeah. And I hope people watching this will will take that on board. That because uh, if they've not been through trauma yet, people watching, it's coming. Yeah. It comes to us all. It One does. day we're well, going to get that it, phone call that we've been yeah. dreading. Yeah. You, you you lose your spouse. You lose your parent, or something. Something happens, and there 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 is a there is a way. Out. And I, yeah, and I've I've fallen a few times before boxing and you know, with, with different court cases and stuff and getting into scraps. Even when I was boxing, got into a situation, you know, defending a mate of mine. But, You're naturally going to have a lot of anger in you. Yeah, and, and it was, when it's injustice and bullies, and I like, fucking hate bullies. You know, my dad hated bullies. If I got into a scrap at school, he'd sit me down. What happened then? He'd have to, we'd have to go through it all, you know, and okay, fair enough. I said, no, I didn't start it, Dad. No, I believe you, I believe you. He'd say, you know, and he would. He'd, he'd, he'd believe what I'd say. He'd take my word for it. What about but, your state of mind, Lee? Uh, uh, have you been diagnosed with anything? Have you had any PTSD, therapy? I, I haven't really had any therapy or I saw a counsellor a bit when I was 15, but I just told him what I wanted to hear. I've sort of, I've sort of counselled myself through the boxing and stuff, but again, recently it started rearing, I get these bouts of real manic depression, suicidal depression, where you feel like, I've put a, I've put a, a league run in neck, a dog league run in neck once, when I was about 30, so I boxed eliminated for British title, lost the fight, got cut in round two, and I was like, God, you know, why, you know, I've tried so hard, I could gone down, I was offered a drug deal, all sorts, you, you meet all sorts of people in that game, mm. you know, and I thought, I'm not letting my dad down, the temptation was there when you've got no money, and you train all the time, you've got girlfriends, you think you're going to support him, because you've got no dough, off they go, do you know what I mean, you're not a safe bet, that's what I used to get told, do you know what I mean, and, and they're giving you the run around, playing mental games with your head, when you've got a fight coming up, and it just, you know, and, I've, and I think I've lost a couple of fights over it, you know, but, you know, when you know you can do better, and that's when it gets tough, that's when it gets tough, and then, 
the, the depression starts kicking in you and then you think, fucking, I remember putting this 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 dog leader on my neck once and I just, just I wasn't going to do it. It was, it was almost like it punishing myself. And yeah, it's, you prick, you lost that. This is what you could, this is this, you know, you could be in the ground tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? You could be in the mortuary, you fucking knob. And then my dog started barking at me, Winston, my little stuffy. The part you want yeah. to join your dad? Yeah, yeah. And I think when I got in the, in the ring, you know, and there's, honestly, mate, there's situations I've got inside in the street and it's, when I look back at it now, it's just like flipping out. I was lucky, really. It could have got worse. But I just thought, it's all right, I'll be with the old chap. You behave like you had a death wish. Yeah, mate, on a mission to snuff it. At times, like, I'm knocking now. You're like on a mission to snuff it. When you don't fear death, it becomes your friend. How'd you cut now? I struggle, mate. Like, recently, again, it's sort of really... It's this, this PTSD has reared itself up again. And, it, and like it has for years, but in cycles. But it's been coming more recently, you know. So I had to put my hands up. I said to my girlfriend, I said, Lise, I said, it happened a few months ago. I said, if it happens again, I'll, I'll promise I'll go and I'll ring somebody up. So I rang the doctors recently and they still haven't got back to me. Told them, no, I need fucking help. I'm struggling. I ain't got back to me yet. Because the problem is now, everybody's claiming, and, oh, i got depression and, and they got a backlog of it. So the people who really needed it help is not getting it, mm. you know. But I know I can keep a handle on it. The timing today has been impeccable. We had a meeting with the police this morning. And again, it all started coming back because it's like 34 years. And then the fact that I'm being that I'm here today, chatting to you, talking to you about this, is like therapy at the same time. Um, I was in the gym yesterday. And I've and I, I got to give a shout out to the Fight Factory in Gloucester. John Pittman, top man, top man. He said, you know, anytime you come and train, more than welcome. He knows what it's like. He knows what I've been through. And, he, and when I did my short film, um, he, he, he shared that. And I, I, I've got to say this to the parents out there, the country over, get your kids in a mixed martial arts gym or a boxing gym because it could save their lives. It really could. It, it has with me. And I, and I will, will admit I'm not fucking perfect. You know, there's times where it all comes back again. I want to do, I want to fucking kill somebody, you know. But what if it's something innocent? What if, what, what if? You know, you get road rage one day, and you I whack somebody and you and you kill them and they got a kid. Do you know what I mean? Uh, what have they got a family? What's it going to do to them? Do you know what I mean? Their, their uh, kids will live with the same anger and pain yes, as you have. Yes, that, that I did. And, uh, and sometimes you think, yeah, you want to... F Not so much them, but it's the people who, who did that to me. Their family, you want them to feel that pain, you know? Because it's indescribable how it comes back and haunts you. Hurt people hurt people. Yeah. I'm not a religious person. I've got family members who are deeply into religion and that's that's their bag, you know, and, and I respect anybody who got their own opinions. But the problem with a lot of religions, they all claim they've got the ultimate truth, you know, and they cause a lot of conflict. I've got a spiritual slant on it all because I lived out in the woods for quite some time in a, in a caravan. I built a log cabin and stuff. And when you sit there amongst nature and you see how the perfect balance in nature, how it all works, suddenly someone's having a little smile there's things that happen you think mm, it's like a perfect balance did you find like, yourself yeah I did a bit yeah I did and I did, and I, I swear by meditation I got to try and get back on it again because it's, it does help a lot and when you looked inwards did you like what you saw yeah I did I choose to, to walk it sounds a bit weird but I choose to walk with the light as much as I can rather than walk with the dark mm. but I honestly think there's something somewhere bigger than all of us who's seen all this going on and I think whether it's here now or wherever we're going to end up I think there's going to be a perfect justice like it could be here or somewhere else and sometimes there are a load of bollocks see what you're on about and where are you going to end up what, what happens now is there a chance that the trial can reopen there's always a chance are you Stuck pushing are you pushing yeah, that again yeah yeah like they say in the boxing room there's always a punchy chance you know, mm. every, is, every that, is that what the today's meet was it is. with the police? The, the possibility, yeah, because because we cannot get it back into court without compelling evidence. There's stuff myself and a good family friend Roger brought up. He's gone over all the trial transcripts, gone right through it all. And he said there's holes in it. There's people who weren't interviewed. The, like like I was saying earlier, that that Terry Moore got his guns. He went to see his mate Steve Smith that day, the morning or the afternoon of the shooting. That was never brought up. You know, he's an accessory. I saw him there that evening in the lane, in in that red fiesta. He was there. So why why was he there? Why is there no record of that? You know, this is this is all evidence. This is all evidence. There's people who weren't interviewed at the time. And they what, might have stuff to say. What was the conversation like today at the police station? It was positive. I thought. Do you think they want too, justice as well? 
They, it's going to be know, a different police force yeah, now, isn't it? It is. Different faces. Exactly, different faces. They sat there, and I, like, I get emotional, like I did today. And it's it's tough, you know. And I, and I think if you keep bottling up all the time, it's it, you, you can get in, in, illnesses. I just really, you know, and you can help. It don't care who you are. Stress kills. It, it stress kills you. And try and bottle up too light is no no good. And I got wasn't expecting to in there. We started going over stuff, and then and, and I and there were these two females, these two ladies. They were very sympathetic. They said, "Look, we promise you, we're on your side. We want this as well. We're on your side." You know, and then Roger, he's um, a former magistrate. He's 76 now, Roger, and he knew my dad. And he, and he, and fair play to him, he stressed the point. He said, listen, he said, all this bollocks of him being, Tony being six foot two, he was not. He says, like, five, eight, five, nine. You know, and, and it's, it's nonsense. And this is, this is wrong. This needs to be put right. There's loads of stuff. Uh, and he brought a lot of stuff out to them. And, and, and when we left, he said, I, I feel that was really positive. Um, I, we both generally felt that they were on our side, you know, they really want to see Good. justice. And although Terry's now dead, yes. you still want the justice. Yeah, because people say, oh yeah, but and they sit behind your back and all that. The problem is a lot of people are so willing just to roll over their feet and you know, give up. Too many people are. And the thing is, it's like it's an old saying, evil will carry on in the world when good people stand by and do nothing. You know, as a collective, as a single person, you can't really do a lot. But as a collective, you can. We're the people who put these wangers in power, but nothing gets done unless people get together and stick together and move forward with it. And today we're like social media and stuff is making things a lot easier. Do you, think the, do, you, do you think the pressure of social media and all the eyes that could now potentially be on this case, do you think it's going to help? Yes, yeah. You're optimistic. Yeah. Optimistic, optimistic. You've got to be optimistic. You know, you've got to be optimistic. I think anything in life, you've got to be optimistic about it, you know. Um, Sometimes the impossible can become possible, you know. Um, there's people who've done stuff in history and when it was, it was, it was not possible. But it's done, it ain't going to stop me trying. Whatever happens, you know, I've got to keep plugging away. And I've got some good people who are trying to reach out and uh, they want to they wanna see this see this through to the end, you, you know. And as long as I've got breath in my body, um, I'm going to keep, keep on plugging away at it. But... It's like for so long, you, 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 you can put it in a box. And so I managed to do something. I was right, it's on a shelf, it's on a box. You know, my uncles, we don't get on so well now. It's, it's a, there's a lot of strains there at the moment from one thing and another. Part of it's the film I did, and I'll do the exactly same thing all over again. Glad I didn't. Wouldn't, glad I did it. Wouldn't change it. But I think with him, a lot of it is because I've taken it out of his hands now. He's, he's like in his 70s. He's had a heart bypass and stuff, you know. He's done his bit. I was the one who was there, you know. It was my dad. Do you know what I mean? I was the one who was there. So if you can't get it done, let's, let's try another angle now. Do you know what I mean? Your granddad never fought his whole life. Absolutely. Your, your dad did. Absolutely. And up till now, so have yeah. you. So yeah, absolutely. Never quit. Keep fighting. Yeah. And on a final note, whatever it is you want to say, get off your chest. What's your final word on the subject? Never give up. Never give up. Miss your dad. Cherish the ones you've got that are still here. Yeah. Hold them with both and try, arms. And try, and try and forgive forgive people sometimes because you know families can be the fucking worst to piss you off. Do you know what I mean? And there's and there's and, and no none of us are perfect. Your mate might do something that really pisses you off, and then he might do something that would piss him off. But we aren't on this we aren't on this earth long. Do you know what I mean? And people think, well, yeah, well, you keep fucking going with that, but this is an internal thing. Is it's a thing I got to do. But like you say, just. I'm glad the last day I spent with my dad on earth was a good day, do you know what I mean? You know, and um, he asked me, he said, Lee, are you proud of me? I said, of course I am, Dad. And he said it to me. He'll still be proud of you, mate. He said to me, uh, like, if I did something naughty, don't let yourself down today, Lee. He said, I'm, I'm proud of you. Don't let yourself down. Never ever turn around, oh, you're useless, you're this. And this is the this is the thing, do you know what I mean? And it, it does it does something to your head as a kid, when you got your dad saying you're you're, you're a hero, you you're idol, everything you want to be, as a kid, you know. Bigging you up makes that have a difference. And I'm just saying, like, I haven't got no children yet, but like parents that I know, just give your son daughter a little bit of lift sometimes. If they, even if they're doing something you might not agree with, just say, hey, it's it's okay to make a mistake. But I'm proud of you, and that can make the world a difference. World a difference. I know some girls have had problems with their, their mums are putting them down and stuff. Oh, because they're jealous, basically. Never do that, do you know what I mean? Lift them up. Lift them up. 
Everybody needs lifting up. You know, and I think some of you at your school, some of you at your workplace, it might be a bit dangerous, might not be as talented as you, whatever, but give them a lift up. Everybody, everybody likes a compliment. There's nothing wrong with saying something well done, you've done a good job. Fair play to you, you know? And, and, and to some, some people, that can make their day. I remember, I remember once on, on, on the tube, um, I was in London and um, going to an audition, and um, this, this veteran was walking up and down, and uh, you get a lot of people trying to get money out of you and stuff. And there was something about this guy, and I gave him my last 20 quid in my wallet. And I've done it a couple of times, you know, because I just think when you give out, you, anybody who's give is never poor. You get something back one way, it just comes back. It's just the way it works. I gave him that 20 quid, and, and he cried. He cried, he said, he's, he was a veteran. He said, I can't get any out. I said, mate, here, you, you need that more than me at the moment. You have it. And the poor bloke cried. But it made me feel so good mm -hmm. when I left it, when I went off. And do you know what? The audition I went to, I got the fucking job. Karma. How about that? You know? Karma. Uh, Lee, I admire your strength, mate. Thank you, Liam. And I, pre for me in. I appreciate you coming on and yeah. trusting me with your story. Thanks very much for having me in here, mate. It's been a sad subject, mate, but it's been a pleasure yeah. spending time with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Come on, mate.